as she says. So we thank you all for coming to Highline Reads, our library's guest reader program on different topics for the adult set. Please note that Zoom settings provide closed captioning live transcription if you need that. Um, we'll also be uploading the reading portion of this event to a LibGuide and our library YouTube for later viewing. So please stay after the recorded reading for a brief off camera and candid discussion if you have time, if you'd like to do that. Um, before we get started with our library program, we'd like to share a land acknowledgement and recognize the people whose land we are on today. Highline College itself, and where many of us live and work, resides on ancestral native lands of the Duwamish Nation. More specifically, depending on exact cities, in this region, many of us live and work on the Muckleshoot, Duwamish, and Puyallup Indigenous lands. We honor the land and give gratitude to the First Nations people that are here. If you'd like to learn more about Native Land, check out this interactive map link in the chat box. So without further ado for this week's Highline Reads, I'd like to welcome English professor Susan Rich and Arcturus Literary Magazine writers Emily, Patty, and Jen, reading from their own writing and various poems. We'll be linking to Susan's books available for checkout through the Highline Library and more information about the Arcturus Literary Magazine in the chat box during their readings. So during the next 30 minutes of reading, we ask that you keep your comments to the chat box and please stay for an optional discussion after the reading that will be off camera. So for now, get comfortable, grab your tea or your water, your snacks, the floor is yours, Susan, Jen, Patty, and Emily. <laughs> All right, let me um, go first. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, it's been an interesting journey trying to get Arcturus going through the pandemic and what all we've achieved together this year. We've each kind of picked one of our own poems that has been submitted, as well as um, a couple of our other favorites and then one from outside of Arcturus. The first one I will be reading is called No Blank Canvas and it is uh, written by Nat T.R. Lavandre. Out of the mugs crack ceramic lip, soft steam billowed through stale air, hissing that this promise just given that you hope to be kept is forgotten. Forfeit among their stressful schedules and slipping thoughts. Again, no chicken coop built, no hike past the pine trees, no clean sink, the beard hair and chunks of soap remain. A journal of every wish come true turns absently through its blank pages. You try to circle back, underline one that part that came true, nothing here. Inside your brain blooms the gray paint circling the empty future you're working on. Your whole life you've wondered what color would show up if one word of theirs were kept, just one. But there is nothing in the gray, not even black. Coward, you've your own color, paint your path back. That was one that I found very empowering in self-realization. I also found it very relatable um, especially with all of us who are you know, at home during the pandemic with significant others driving us crazy. Um, but I loved the change in perspective in that one. The second one is by Collier Gerke and it's called Where Flesh Meets Roots. Uh, this one I chose because I love the outdoors as you can probably tell by my background, I am more at home and at peace in the woods so this was kind of my calming piece that I found and often reread. It's called Where Flesh Meets Root. Complaints do not have a home here, not in the forest. So I do not speak. I listen to things growing. I walk into the twilight woods, moving like a whisper, my breath trapped between the trees, leaving behind the rigid gray structures of an overthinking world. Twisted tree branches reach into the sky, ivy leaves wrap around trunks that I trace with my soft fingers. I touch everything, even the things that scare me. Nothing escapes my intrigue of this place. Yearning for the closeness of the wood and the leaf, I move deeper into the dark wild. 
through hill and hollow and stream, round log and bog and sleepy glade, I roam in quiet reflection. My bones feel settled here. My nerves are at ease. Among the dirt and moss, I stand and wonder, why would I ever go back? Um, uh, regarding finding poetry outside, I know it can be really difficult and overwhelming when you do a Google search trying to find a poet or poet that you like. And I went down the rabbit hole and I often do on poets.org where I will find one artist, see something I like, and I will go to the relative, you know, relative artists um, that have something similar. And I stumbled across an artist named Kazim Ali on poets.org. I found the piece very philosophical and introspective as well as like hopeful and also very relatable. Um, it's called Exit Strategy. I hear the sound of the sprinkler outside, not the soft kind like we used to run through, but the hard kind that whips in one direction, then cranks back and starts again. Last night we find the, we plan to find the white argument of the Milky Way, but we are 20 years too late. Last night I cut the last stargazer lily to wear in my hair. This morning, the hardest geography quiz I've ever taken. How does one carry oneself from mountain to lake to desert without leaving anything behind? Perhaps I ought to have worked harder. Perhaps I could have paid more attention. A mountain I didn't climb, music I learned, yearned for, but could not achieve. I travel without maps. I freestyle my scripture, pretend the sky is an adequate representation of my spiritual beliefs. The sprinkler switches off, the grass will be wet, I haven't even gotten to page two of my life, and I'm probably more than halfway through. Who knows what kind of creature I will become. And then for the last one I'll be reading before I hand it off to the next editor is uh, written by me. It's called For Your Convenience. For uh, a good period of time, I lived out of my car. And so when Susan Rich had written or given us an assignment to do a persona poem, I was trying to find something to do it on um, and a notebook came to my mind because it's always the first thing you go to. It's generally there. If you don't have a notebook, you can use a napkin or lipstick or there's always a substitute for a notebook. So this is called For Your Convenience. I feel your fingers caress my leather spine, tracing the edges of my worn out curves. I yield to you as your mind anxiously unravels. I can taste the salty ink as you scratch across my porous flesh my once barren pages, a sacrifice for your aspirations. Grant me your grocery lists, your homework, tales of your intimate introspections. Fill my lines with your secrets. My once crisp pages, now softened by your touch. Significant corners earmarked for your convenience. I grant you endless possibilities. I believe I'm passing it off to Jen next. Yes, you are. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Jen. I am one of the editors for Octurus. And today I will be reading to you four poems. Two of them will be from the um, Octurus that I personally enjoyed myself. And then also a poem by Ocean Vong and one of my own pieces. So the first piece I'll be reading to you is Grape Jelly by Victoria. I, can't, I don't want to butcher her last name. As Kovacic, I, <laughs> Kovacic, I believe. Um, but I love this piece especially because it takes such a, like an interaction with a stranger and turns it really personal and a more meaningful discussion versus just something that's brief and forgettable. Grape Jelly. A lady at the store was returning her purchases today. She returned all except one, gummy bears. At least that's what she told me. She couldn't return those because she craved them every night lately, she said. What an interesting craving. She told me it wasn't chocolate she craved or any other sweet candy. It was just gummy bears. She then proceeded to tell me that she also craves sweet and salty things, very much so. In fact, her face lit up when she talked about peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I started to think about how much I've always loved that combination, irresistible at times. I tried to recall the taste on the tip of my tongue. 
She told me that she has lots of jelly in her fridge, but none are quite as satisfying to use for spreading as the Welch's grape packets. With packets, they can be used up with one use. That's what she liked most, she told me. Using jars of jelly, you can just never be too sure. That gave me something to think about. I mean, how often do we think about simple things such as this? I listened with curiosity. I enjoyed this conversation, loved every moment while it lasted and never wanted it to end. The conversation of types that you remember, not an everyday basic conversation, you know. Grateful for those and more to come. Thank you. And this next piece is by Kyler Osmondson. And the title is Grasping at Gold. And it is, um, I love this piece so much too because it ties food into it. And I love food, I'm a huge foodie. <laughs> and I, so I love everything about this. And also it relates to the pandemic. So it's like a double whammy for me. Grasping at Gold. Standing over steaming stir fry, laced in spices, the shrimp simmers in a fiery red hue. Is a hint of heat unbearable? Old friends and new, feigning the familiarity of chopsticks as wontons wiggle between our grass, as does the moment, dissolving into division, followed by an empty apartment. The sauce sits and settles, turning to yellow. I hope the golden days lie ahead, but I fear I miss them. <laughs> and this next piece that I'm reading is about my plant, Matilda. She is an angel wing begonia and I love her so dearly and she's huge. So I had to write a poem about her. <laughs> and it's springtime too, thank you. <laughs> so let's see. How to care for Matilda. It may be absurd to snap off a limb of the mother plant and force her into a mason jar of only tap water, greedily hoping for her to generate fingers that I impatiently rush a creature to produce. It may sound cruel, yet the angel wings flamed with snowy silver freckles show how she loves to be sculpted by these tenderly violent hands. She pleads me to fracture her flourishing tower of stems, so I slice her ligaments. Set aside, only acknowledge when sights of white strings tangle on the floor of glass, signaling the time of transplant. I abruptly shovel her offspring into a confining terracotta, being sure to suffocate this angel with soil speckled in perlite, allowing the roots to inhale, for I, only know how to selfishly tend to her green spines, where she only knows to flaunt her plump foliage after I break and crack the very neck that holds her up. Thank you. And so, oh, that was, so I meant to read Abed um, with, with Burning City by Ocean Vong, but I kind of rearranged them, but that's okay. So um, this next poem that I'll be reading is by Ocean Vong and he's actually, I just love the way that he's able to describe things in such an elo like, elegant and beautiful way, even though it is kind of um, like a tough topic to discuss. So, Abed with Burning City, and I will begin the epigraph. South Vietnam, April, April 29, 1975. Armed forces radio played Irving Berlin's White Christmas as a code to begin Operation Frequent Wind, the ultimate evacuation of American civilians and Vietnamese refugees by helicopter during the fall of Saigon. Milk flower petals on the street, like pieces of a girl's dress. May your days be bright and merry. He fills a teacup with champagne, brings it to her lips. Open, he says. She opens. Outside, a soldier spits out his cigarette as footsteps fill the square like stones fallen from the sky. 
May all your Christmases be white as a traffic guard unstraps his holster. His hand running the hem of her white dress, his black eyes, her black hair, a single candle, their shadows, two wicks. A military truck speeds through the intersection, the sound of children shrieking inside, a bicycle hurled through a store window. When the dust rises, a black dog lies in the road, panting, its hind legs crushed into the shine of a white Christmas. On the nightstand, a sprig of magnolia expands like a secret herd for the first time. The treetops glisten and children listen. The chief of police, face down in a pool of Coca-Cola, a palm-sized photo of his father soaking behind his left ear. The song moving through the city like a widow, a white, a white, I'm dreaming of a curtain of snow falling from her shoulders. Snow crackling against the window, snow shredded with gunfire, red sky. Now on the tanks rolling over the city wall, a helicopter lifting the living just out of reach. The city is so white it is ready for ink. The radio saying, run, run, run. Milk flower petals on a black dog like pieces of a girl's dress. May your days be merry and bright, she is saying, something neither of them can hear. The hotel rocks beneath them, the bed of a field of ice cracking. Don't worry, he says, as the first bomb brightens their faces. My brothers have won the war, and tomorrow the lights go out. I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming, to hear sleigh bells in the snow. In the square below, a nun on fire runs silently toward her god. Open, he says. She opens. Thank you. And I will pass it on to Susan. There we go. Hopefully you can hear me now. Yes. So that was amazing. Everything's been amazing. I, um, I need a minute to kind of collect myself. I was so in Ocean Vong's words and Jen's words. I just want to make sure everyone here knows that Arcturus is the literary magazine of Highline College. And it is completely edited by these amazing poets that you're listening to. And you are able to get a copy of Arcturus for free through the Highline Bookstore. So normally we would be giving them out physically, but they can be mailed to you. And we take submissions from students all year long and faculty. We have a number of different pieces this year um, by faculty photographers, faculty writers. So I can't help but do a plug. And I also want to um, just say a little bit of each about each of these editors. So because I want to brag about them. It's the best group of editors I've ever had, I have to say. And I could tell you lots of things about each of them, but I'll just try to limit myself to one. So Emily, who you saw um, start us off, Emily Hamilton, she not only is one of the winners of the National Poetry Contest, but she also started a program for the very first time Arcturus is being given out to people who um, are getting food deliveries from the, the Highline College food pantry. So is that right, Emily? Do I have that right? Uh, as a way to distribute during COVID, yes. Yes, yes. So um, that was just, I thought, a brilliant idea that was all Emily's and she, she made it happen. Jen, who you've just heard, has two poems in a journal called In Parentheses, which is an online journal and a print journal. And it is not a student journal, but for an assignment, I kind of had these incredible writers send off to different journals. And a few weeks later, Jen has two poems that are coming out. So she's a rock star, <laughs> you're hearing her here first. And Patty, who you'll hear after me, Patty is the first prize winner of the National Poetry Contest. 
And that got tweeted out by Highline and I'll let her tell the story of how a famous movie director has contacted her because of her poem and because of Highline's tweet. So I don't wanna ruin that. I hope she'll tell that story. Yeah. I, could, I could go on, but these, um, these are incredible people. Do you wanna do that now, Patty, or when you, when you read? Um, I'm not reading that poem, so I can do that now. <laughs> sure, go for it. My poem that won um, the contest, um, Decasia, is named after a film about rotten art. Um, it's a, an art movie um, with decayed film. And the director of the um, film, Bill Morrison, um, the film was tagged when Highline College tweeted out the story about me winning. And he replied back and congratulated me and then has since followed me on Twitter because I finally have my Twitter active now <laughs> and um, told me how much he loved the poem. So that's pretty cool. Congratulations. So you never know what's gonna happen when you write a poem. I think that's completely true. So I'll start with two poems that are going to be in Arcturus 2021. That's the year that we're in. And I just will say that these haven't been read out before, but the poets do know that their pieces have been chosen. So this first poem is called Plush, and the poet is Chelsea Lowry. And it's after a poem by Kim Adonizio. And the way that works is in class, we had read a poem called Red Dress by Kim Adonizio. And Chelsea was inspired to take that kind of um, over the top love for something and move it to something else. So this is called Plush after Kim Adonizio. I want a collection of lipsticks, one in every single shade, colors that wrap around my lips and decorate the words they speak. I want to be able to pick from sweet cherry reds, candy pinks, and nutty browns so that I can coordinate the shades to my mood swings. I want people to stare at my mouth and dream about popsicle flavors, demands and promises outlined in flushed watermelon kisses. And I want all my lipsticks and a glossy finish so that my lips will leave a mark on every surface they grace. So that when I kiss you, there'll be no mistaking my popular pout. I think during COVID, it's really nice to have poems that have humor and lightness to them. Um, not all of them have to be that way, but I find myself drawn to things mm -hmm. that are like that. And this next poem is the poem that opens up Arcturus 2021, because we've just ordered it. It's going to Dave um, in the print shop next week. And this poem is by Patty Wells, and you'll hear from her after me. It's called, When Travel is No Longer an Option. I have created a land within myself, turned flesh to earth, poured memories out of my mind so lakes could form sat upon their banks, staring out into the horizon of my loneliness. There are no borders around the land that is me. No immigration lines, no visa required to visit. What was once just a human body has become a destination spot, an escape. That's a hard poem to follow, right? I'm glad I don't have to follow it. I'm going to let Stanley Kunitz follow it. So one of the things I did when I was young, and I still try to do, is keep a notebook of favorite poems. And I do believe that if you do this and you write it out by hand, so you'll, not, you'll only be able to see kind of blurry things. Yeah, that's OK, because my handwriting was so much better 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt like I was able to take in the craft of the poems much better when I wrote it by hand. I would do it slowly and I would use it as a warm up 
for getting my head into the right space to write. And then life got busier. And so as this journal goes on, I started um, cutting things out of journals and just scotch taping them in. But I, I may try to go back to that handwriting because I remember it felt like it helped me as a writer. So one of the poems that I'm gonna put in this notebook that's been on my refrigerator for a super long time. So you can see it's actually kind of brown now and before it um, collapses, it's a poem that I've probably had on the refrigerator for 20 years. And I say that because sometimes a poem strikes you at a certain moment and it gets under your skin and it's with you for life. So that's why I decided to choose something from a long time ago because every time I hear it, I'm, I'm just filled with the love I had the first time. It's by a poet by the name of Stanley Kunitz. And just a couple of fun things about him. There's, you can find poems of his online at poetry.org or the Poetry Foundation is a great place. He got famous after 60. So, you know, that sounds good to me to get famous after 60. And he was Jewish. And at the time, um, he died around the, in the, in the mid 1990s. So he must have been born at the turn of the century. He was not allowed to teach at Harvard because they had a quota on how many Jewish people were allowed there. And they had filled their quota. So although he was an incredible poet and very, you know, very much, um, what am I trying to say? he would have gotten the job had he not been Jewish. So I, I just find him an interesting person. And the last thing I'll say about him before I read the poem is when I got to see him in person, he was very old. He was in his 90s. So I think I can say that's really old. And he got to the podium to read and he's all hunched over and his head's kind of like that. And then he starts reading the poems and he grows like five inches just by the fact that he starts doing something I think that he loves. And I just remember seeing him and all of a sudden it wasn't that bald head, but it was a glowing face. And I thought, wow, poetry can do that. Poetry can make you younger. Like, why wouldn't I wanna be a poet? So, okay, here's the poem. It's called The Layers. I have walked through many lives, some of them my own. And I am not who I was, though some principle of being abides from which I struggle not to stray. When I look behind, as I am compelled to look before I can gather strength to proceed on my journey, I see the milestones dwindling toward the horizon and the slow fires trailing from the abandoned campsites over which scavenger angles wheel on heavy wings. Oh, I have made myself a tribe of my true affections and my tribe is scattered. How shall the heart be reconciled to its feast of losses? In a rising wind, the manic dust of my friends, those who fell along the way, bitterly stings my face. Yet I turn, I turn, exulting somewhat with my will intact to go wherever I need to go. And every stone on the road is precious to me. In my darkest night, when the moon was covered and I roamed through wreckage, a nimbus clouded voice directed me, live in the layers, not on the litter. Though I lack the art to decipher it, no doubt the next chapter in my book of transformations is already written. I am not done with my changes. So that's called The Layers by Stanley Kunitz. And now I'm gonna to try to follow that. That's crazy. So I, changed my mind a few times on what I'm going to read, but I think because I loved um, Grape Jelly so much when Jen read it, I'm going to try to read you something that hopefully is a little humorous. And if you've heard me read, you know I sometimes like to do the crazy thing of reading a poem that's really new. So you are the first people to hear this. 
Um, if you could see my clipboard, which is going, of course, in and out, because I don't want to show you my messy house, but there's still <laughs> scribbles. There's still things that are scribbled on it. That's okay. But you'll know it's a rough draft, right? And it's called Clowning Around with God. So I really hope it doesn't offend anybody. That was one concern. And it starts with an epigraph that supposedly comes from the book of Ezekiel. Um, chapter three, verse one through three, but I think the translation might be a little bit contemporary. So this is Ezekiel chapter three, verse one through three. And he said to me, son of man, eat what is before you, eat this scroll, then go and speak to the people of Israel. I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. So the only other thing you might want to know is that Ezekiel is a prophet and um, the book of Ezekiel is in the Old Testament. Clowning around with God. Did it taste of local honey? The parchment spun light as a crepe. And did she listen with pleasure to the acoustics of the snack? Small crunches heard across the valley Oh, Ezekiel, what was he thinking? Could a scroll be kosher, gluten-free? Did she offer him Sabbath wine, a glass of Shiraz to wash it down, a pony? Clowning around with God, and then what? When he delivered her text to the people of Israel, was he meant to regurgitate each verse or to lecture? Was she too busy carving commandments to go herself? Oh, God, her mind closed to him like a girl's first day book embossed in blue gold leaf, the key forgotten, the lock stubborn. And what about him? Profound indigestion, a tums for each verse, please. Ezekiel, Ezekiel, he kissed words goodbye took up the wheel, worked from home. Still, he adored fine dining, a meal with something to say, the textures and tastes of the divine. So I saw a few smiles and that's what I was going for and hopefully no one too offended. Mm. And um, sometimes it's fun, you know, you take a chance when you come to a poetry reading, are you gonna like anything that happens? So I think it's good for a poet to take a chance and try to read something new. And last but not least, I would love to introduce to you, Patty Wells. Hey. Hello, everyone, thank you for coming. Um, I am going to read, I'll start with a poem from the Sears Arcturus. And then I'll be reading a couple of poems uh, that I recently came across from outside and finish with a poem of my own. So this first poem, The Fire of Learning by Mason Papp, um, I chose because as a non-traditional student returning to college at 40 years old, uh, that hey. fire <laughs> is burning deep within me. Um, and I really appreciate the imagery in this poem when it speaks to that. The Fire of Learning by Mason Happ. To understand the words, you need to forget the blazing beat of your chest, the self-taught rhythm, a single ember keeping the flame alive, life of language with smoke that squeezes one's personal circle. To understand their phrases, you need to char this tiger strength shadow choking your words and reaching for alien ones that seem to hum a love song without letting out a note. I am listening to their phrases. They twirl at a distance, ribbons flowing the wind, dressed in peacock-like hues that avert the eyes, idle in this chamber, sounds bounce off thick concrete, a self-taught rhythm, invading and edging only to reach my ears while language waits outside the door. Messy, but simple. There is the me outside with charred shadows and there is the me who only knows the fear of scorching hot steps. Mm -hmm. 
So the next poem I'm going to read, I just came across uh, last week during spring break. Um, I tend to collect poems. Um, this one came from the New Yorker um, and is by a poet named Ellen Bass, but I'll also put in the chat, we have a lot of links to poets.org, but um, I signed up for their poem a day where it sends a poem to your inbox. So you guys might be interested in that as well because it's a great way to discover new poems. Um, so this is How to Apologize by Ellen Bass. <laughs> Cook a large fish, choose one with many bones. A skeleton will need, you will need skill to expose. Maybe the flying silver, scar silver carp that's invaded the Great Lakes tumbling into other tumbling the others into oblivion if you don't live near a lake you'll have to travel walking is best and shows you mean it but you could take a train and let yourself be soothed by the rocking on the rails it's permi permitted to receive solace for whatever you did or didn't do pitiful beautiful human when my mother was in the hospital my daughter and I had to clear out the home she wouldn't return to. Then she recovered and asked, incredulous, how could you have thrown out all my shoes? Mm -hmm. So you'll need a boat. You could rent or buy, but for the sake of repairing the world, build your own. Thin strips of western cedar are perfect, but don't cut a tree. There'll be a demolished barn or downed trunk if you venture further and someone will have a mill and someone will loan you tools. The perfume of sawdust and the curls that fall from your plane will sweeten the hours. Each night we dream 36 billion dreams. In one, we could dream back everything lost. So grill the pale flesh. Unharness yourself from your weary stories, then carry the oily, succulent fish to the one you hurt. There is much to fear as a creature caught in time, but this is safe. You need no defense. This is just another way to know you are alive. Oh. So <laughs> I love that poem just because I love poems that speak to humanness and forgiveness for the things that we put ourselves through or uh, we um, worry about too much. The simplicity of forgiving with a cooked fish. Um, the next poem I'm going to read is um, from Denez Smith from his book, Don't Call Us Dead. And I came across this poem at a poetry seminar for a college MFA program that I'm interested in. And it just struck me because of the time of the world that we're going through right now, um, the experiences that I've had with myself and my family um, being Black Americans uh, during uh, a time when militarized police are so prevalent. It's called From Summer Somewhere. Somewhere, a sun. Below, boys, brown as rye, play the dozens and ball, jump in the air and stay there. Boys become new moons, gum dark on all sides, bag bruise, blue water to fly, at least tide, at least spit, spit back a father or two. I won't get started. History is what it is. It knows what it did. Bad dog, bad blood, bad day to be a boy. Oh. Color of July well spent, but here, not earth, not heaven. Boys can't recall their white shirt turned a ruby gown. Here, there is no language for officer or law no color to call white. If snow fall, fell, it fall black. Please don't call us dead. Call us alive someplace better. We say our own names when we pray. We go out for sweets and come back. Whew, 
Uh, that's, <laughs> that's a hard one to follow. Um, so I will be reading um, my own poem next. Um, I wrote this poem as a warm up prompt in Susan's class, creative writing class. Um, I really loved, it's uh, written as a pojack to um, the poet Dorothy Trogdon. And I remember um, when she was introduced to us, um, the information that we got was she also was a poet who started late in life, I think in her 60s or 70s. Wow. Um, <laughs> although she had been writing much before that. Um, and so I was really inspired by, by that because I'm starting to write regularly in my 40s. So oh. the poem is called Loneliness Like a Next Door Neighbor Whose Name You Do Not kn Know after Dorothy Trogdon. Loneliness resides beside you, moved in when the market was low. How odd it is to be greeted each day by what you've spent your whole life avoiding. Yet there it is, beckoning like a long lost friend as you tend your garden, interrupting even your solitude. Until you invite it over, talk about the weather, politics, who will win the Super Bowl, Meaningless chit chat as a prelude to true understanding. Laugh at its jokes. Ask what brought it to the neighborhood. Listen as if you truly cared to know. Look at the stranger sipping coffee at ease on your blue sofa. The morning glory's blossom is often ripped out as a weed only to return again next spring. Thank you. So that concludes our part of um, today in terms of our formal presentations, but I think Jerry has some words to give you plugs for different events that are coming up in case you like coming to poetry events sponsored by Highline. Um, and then I hope you'll stick around just for some conversation, but I'm gonna give it back to Jerry, but thank you so much. This was great. Yeah, thank you all for um, joining us today. Um, thank you to Jen, Emily, Patty, and Susan for sharing and reading with us today. Um, so many amazing pieces. This concludes the recorded part of this program.